The real breakthrough was finding enzymes in the worm's saliva, part of the uh, phenol oxidase family. Enzymes that actually break down the polyethylene molecule itself. That's that's pretty wild. <laughs> Over 300 million tons. Just think about that number for a second. That is staggering. That's the plastic waste we churn out globally every single year. And uh, the really sobering part, less than 10%, maybe even less, actually gets recycled. Yeah, it's a huge mismatch. We're talking about polyethylene, polypropylene, polystyrene, yep. stuff designed to last practically forever. Exactly. Hmm. Well, today we're Edward and Lily from Dance Blank. And we're diving into something pretty unexpected, a uh, a tiny potential helper in this massive crisis. It really is fascinating. We're going to unpack a story based on some, well, some intriguing findings, mm -hmm. including a bit of an accidental discovery back in 2017. That's right, involving biologist Federica Bertacchini and some uh, surprisingly destructive little larvae. So our mission for you today is simple. We want to give you the shortcut, understand how these creatures work on plastic, the science behind it, what it could all mean and uh, also look at other cool tech in the recycling world. Think of it as your quick guide through this really complex but super important issue. Okay, so before we get to the uh, the main characters, the worms, let's just quickly set the scene again, the plastic problem. Right, hundreds of millions of tons a year. A lot of it is single use, designed to be thrown away. And it just sticks around. It doesn't break down naturally, which is why it ends up everywhere, oceans, landfills, everywhere. Precisely. It's built to resist breakdown. That's the whole point and the whole problem. Okay, and to the waxworms. Galleria melanella for the scientists listening. Little moth larvae. Normally you find them in beehives munching on beeswax. Ah, but here's the twist. Federica Bertocchini, the biologist we mentioned, she was cleaning out hives back in 2017. Put some of these worms in a plastic bag. Yeah. A regular polyethylene shopping bag. And, well, you can guess what happened next, can't you? Yeah, holes appeared. Pretty quickly, too. Within about 40 minutes, apparently, they just chewed right through it, which understandably made her think, hmm, what's going on here? Led to a proper study, didn't it? Publishing Current Biology. It did. And they dug into how this was happening. Was it just chewing or something more? And it was something more, right? Not just physical munching. Exactly. The real breakthrough was finding enzymes in the worm's saliva part of the uh, phenol oxidase family. Enzymes that actually break down the polyethylene molecule itself. That's, that's pretty wild. It is. And what's really key here is that this happens at room temperature. No need for high heat or special pretreatments. Which is a big deal compared to some other processes. A huge deal. And it's direct action by the saliva enzymes, not like reliant on bacteria in their gut or anything like that, which we see in some other plastic degrading organisms. They even tested this with uh, like mashed up worms. A paste. Yeah, they made a paste, applied it to plastic film, and it still caused degradation. That really points the finger at the enzymes. So polyethylene, long chains of ethylene monomers, basically. Right, very long, stable chains. And these enzymes manage to snip them. They do. They break them into smaller bits, molecules that contain oxygen, including something called ethylene glycol. Okay, and they quantified this. How fast does it work? Well, the study found that unhundred waxworms could break down about 92 milligrams of polyethylene in just 12 hours. Hmm, 92 milligrams. It doesn't sound like a huge amount, maybe, but for a hundred tiny worms in half a day. Relative to their size, it's pretty efficient, yeah. So why can they do this? Is it just a fluke? Probably not. The thinking connects back to their natural diet, beeswax. Ah, right. You said they eat beeswax. Exactly. And chemically speaking, beeswax is made of long-chain hydrocarbons, which are structurally, well, kind of similar to polyethylene. So the enzymes they evolved to digest wax just happen to work on this man-made plastic, too. That's the leading hypothesis, a sort of evolutionary pre-adaptation, you might say. Fascinating. Okay, so the big question, what can we actually do with this? What are the potential applications? Well, the obvious one is thinking big industrial scale. Like harnessing those enzymes somehow. Yeah. Imagine isolating those enzymes or maybe even synthesizing them chemically and putting them to work in big bioreactors. You could feed polyethylene waste in, let the enzymes break it down. That could potentially handle large volumes of plastic waste, right? Divert it from landfill. That's the hope. It could be a significant tool. What about um, making plastics themselves biodegradable? Could the enzymes be built in? That's another really interesting idea floating around, integrating the enzymes or something that produces them into the plastic 
during manufacturing. So the plastic would sort of self-destruct after use, under the right conditions, presumably. Something like that, built-in breakdown. And maybe smaller scale uses too, not just giant factories. Could be. You could envision smaller localized enzymatic treatment systems, mm -hmm. maybe for community recycling centers or specific waste streams. Given how much polyethylene pollution there is, bags, films, packaging, any of these could make a dent. Definitely. But we need to be realistic, too. This isn't a silver bullet, is it? No, absolutely not. As cool as it is, there are definite hurdles. Big ones. Like just scaling it up, making enough enzyme affordably. That's a major one. Industrial enzyme production can be costly. Is it cheaper than current recycling? Or even landfill, unfortunately? That's a key economic question. It immediately works on polyethylene, right? What about all the other plastics? PT bottles, polystyrene foam. Good point. Specificity is another limitation. These enzymes seem pretty focused on PE. We need solutions for all the major plastic types. And you mentioned ethylene glycol as a byproduct. Is that safe? Well, it needs managing. It's used in antifreeze, for example. You wouldn't want to just release large amounts of it into the environment. So byproduct management is crucial. Okay, and using the worms themselves, like releasing swarms of wax worms, Probably not practical. Highly impractical. Think of the resources needed to breed billions of worms. Plus, they're considered pests by beekeepers. Not ideal. And then there are the ecological risks. Releasing enzymes or maybe genetically engineered microbes that produce them. That needs careful thought. Huge caution needed there. Unintended consequences in ecosystems are a major concern with any new biological technology release. So the waxworms are like a fantastic proof of concept. An inspiring discovery. Exactly. They show us what's possible biologically, but they're likely just one tool in a much bigger toolbox we need to build. Which brings us to what else is in that toolbox? What other technologies are being developed? Right. There's a lot happening. One big area is chemical recycling. Pyrolysis is a key example. Pyrolysis? Yeah. Sounds technical. Break it down for us. Think of it like high-tech decomposition. You use intense heat, but crucially without oxygen. This breaks the plastic polymers down into simpler chemicals, sometimes oils or gases. And what can you do with those? You can potentially use them as fuel or ideally as feedstock to make new plastics, closing the loop. A big plus is it can often handle mixed plastics, even slightly contaminated ones. Stuff that traditional recycling struggles with. Precisely, but the downside. Let me guess. Energy, cost. You got it. It takes a lot of energy and making it economically competitive is still a challenge. But companies like Plastic Energy are making progress turning waste into a product they call to coil. To coil. Okay. What else? Depolymerization. Yeah, similar goal, different method. This is about chemically breaking the polymers all the way back down to their original building blocks, the monomers. Like taking Lego bricks apart. Exactly. And then you can use those monomers to build brand new, high quality polymers. It works especially well for plastics like pizza stuff and drink bottles. Yeah. So you can get really high quality recycled plastic this way, like virgin material. Potentially, yes. It avoids the quality degradation you sometimes see with mechanical recycling, but... There's always a but. It tends to be specific to certain plastic types, like PTT, and often needs pure streams and precise conditions. Companies like Carbios are doing cool work here, even using enzymes for peat depolymerization. Enzymes again. Okay, what about biodegradable plastics? We hear about those all the time. Right. These are usually made from renewable resources like cornstarch or sugarcane. They're designed to break down, but often only only under specific conditions. Like in an industrial composting facility, not just in your backyard, compost bin, or oh. the ocean. Exactly. That's the catch. The big advantage is reducing long-term waste accumulation if they're disposed of correctly. But they need their own collection and processing systems, which aren't everywhere. PLA is a common example. So helpful, but doesn't solve the existing plastic mountain. Correct. And then there are the microbes, actual plastic-eating bacteria, and fungi. Like that Japanese bacterium, Idianella psychiensis, the one that eats PET. That's the famous one. Scientists are finding and engineering microbes with enzymes like PTase from Idianella that can munch on various plastics. Some are even engineering E. coli to do it. Wider range of plastics, potentially. That's the hope. But challenges remain. Degradation can be slow, and again, the ecological risks of releasing engineered microbes are a big question mark. Still, they're making progress improving the enzymes. Definitely. Lots of work on making enzymes like PTase faster and more stable. 
Then there's nanotechnology entering the picture. Tiny tech for a big problem. How does that work? Nanoparticles can do a couple of things. They have huge surface area, which can help break plastics down physically, or they can act as catalysts to speed up chemical or biological degradation. So making other processes work better or faster? Kind of, yeah. But it's mostly early stage research. Scalability, cost, and potential environmental impacts of nanoparticles themselves need more investigation. Think things like titanium dioxide nanoparticles activated by UV light. Okay, lots of futuristic stuff. Yeah. What about just improving the recycling we already do, mechanical recycling? Absolutely. That's still crucial, and it's getting smarter. Think AI-powered sorting systems that can identify and separate different plastic types much more accurately than before. Like robots sorting the trash. Essentially, yes. Companies like AMP Robotics are leaders here. Plus, better washing and processing techniques mean higher quality recycled pellets can be produced from a wider range of inputs. So making the traditional methods work harder and smarter. Exactly. It improves efficiency, quality, and the range of what can be practically recycled. Still limited by contamination and mixed materials, but getting better. Wow. Okay, so putting it all together, waxworms, pyrolysis, enzymes, microbes, AI sorting, it's not one single answer, is it? Not at all. It really looks like we'll need a combination of strategies. Improving mechanical recycling, scaling up chemical recycling where it makes sense, developing targeted biological solutions like enzymatic degradation. And the waxworms, while maybe not the whole solution themselves, are kind of this amazing symbol a reminder of nature's potential. I think so. That accidental discovery really sparked imagination and showed that biology might offer pathways we hadn't even considered. It pushes innovation across the board. It's a fascinating field. Okay, let's wrap this up. As we finish this deep dive, here's something for you, our listeners, to chew on. Metaphorically speaking, of course. Right. Given all these different technologies, bowling up enzymes, heat, microbes, smart sorting, what do you think will make the biggest difference in tackling plastic waste over say, the next decade. And alongside that, what's the role for us as individuals? How can our choices support these larger shifts? Big questions. Definitely worth thinking about. It really gets you thinking about investment, policy, and personal responsibility, doesn't it? It does. And on that reflective note, please do like, subscribe, follow us, whatever the button says on your app, and check out our website, www.dansplain.xyz. Yep. You'll find all our latest deep dives there, plus articles, info on partner products, and loads more content. Thanks for joining us.